My free history. Little Jim has spent years working on a farm. Now he is ripped. Afterwards, he spent years working and training. Now he is a fighting machine. Although these fighting machines were supposed to serve the Sultan, the Janissaries also were a danger to him. Why did the Sultan take this risk and how did he keep his fighters loyal? At the summit of all and everything was the Sultan, or Padishah, who was the shadow of God on earth. Not simply the bestower of all offices, but also the trustee and heir of all his peoples. All the Janissaries had, they got from the Sultan. The close relationship to him was an integral part of their identity. For the Sultan, the Janissaries had a vital role. The Janissaries were clearly a state commissioned army, or to be more accurate, a Sultan's army. Since their origin, they were intended for the Sultan's exclusive use and put under his direct patronage. Even in the later period, when they became a part of the state apparatus and one military institution among others, Although the sovereign no longer took part in military campaigns in person, they kept some of the close ties with him. Komerich goes even further. He describes the role the Janissaries played in order to centralize the power in the person of the Sultan. There had been a native Turkish nobility, but this body had for the most part been suppressed by the end of the 15th century, and all the positions which would be given to nobles in other states would be conferred upon those individuals who had been drafted through the death chemi. This means, as much as the Sultan relied on the Janissaries, they also were a danger to him. As elite soldiers in his closest vicinity, they could easily overthrow him, influence politics or decide on the next vizier. Building on its centrality for leader survival, the military can establish substantial bargaining or arm twisting powers over the civilian rulers to pursue its corporate interests, which may sometimes be affiliated with policies that impede battlefield effectiveness and contradict a state's long-term security priorities. The case of the Ottoman Empire from the 16th century until 1826 fits this third category. This means that the Sultan had to watch his favorite thugs carefully. The fact, for example, that we come across sultanic orders concerning Janissaries or Janissaries cadets, including orders dealing with very minor affairs which are not ordinary ferments but edicts of the highest ranks, is significant. It is an expression of the exceptional status of these subordinates. Here we see that the Sultan used to control the Janissaries as closely as possible. Of course, the best insurance the Sultan had was to make the Janissaries heavily dependent on his person. We will soon hear about all the benefits the Janissaries received. Everything they had came from the Sultan. This becomes obvious by recalling that the Janissaries called him the father who feeds us. But what if good is were not good enough? Janissary democracy was that of the Barber law. An emotional response to the utterance of a tachyant petty bourgeoisie. Heated by the irritations of the moment, the policies were only of that moment. A Janissary inspired revolt was always directed at individuals or figureheads, although not always the right ones. A vizier might hang in the hippodrome as a symbol of ill government when he himself was working to alter the policy in question. Revolts? That sounds dangerous. But where to draw the line for bad behavior? Which action of a Janissary is acceptable and which is not? Luckily, every Janissary was embedded in a rigid system of values through his order as well as the Ochak. These were like families or tribes respectively and through their rules held the institution together. The Janissary's sole loyalty to the Sultan as well as their elite status was enforced through strict discipline which followed a set of laws. Luckily, Murat I, the Sultan who died in the Battle of Kosovo, instituted 16 rules for the corps. First of all, a Janissary had to show total obedience to his officers. In addition, there were unity of purpose and strict military behavior. Another point was the Janissaries should not have any extremes in luxury or abstinence. They should show strict piety under the Bagdashi code, which we will discuss in the near future and only the best recruits should be accepted into the core. If the rules were broken, the offender could receive capital punishment, but only by his own officers. In contrast, there also was promotion, but mostly by seniority. 
The Janissaries should look after their own dependents. As ordinary soldiers, they should neither grow beards nor marry before their retirement. They had to live in barracks, take on no other trades, had to devote their lives during peacetime to military training and finally use neither alcohol or gamble. I am sure there was no logical conflict whatsoever between the clauses about no extreme abstinence and the forbidding of marriage, alcohol and gambling. But how to determine if a Janissary broke a rule? As an elite soldier, an ordinary peasant was nearly powerless against him. Goodwin describes punishment as follows. He embodied civil authority, but, although he could only be punished by his own officers, he could be beaten on the buttocks for a serious crime, unlike the Sipahis, who could only be bastionated on the feet. The Janissaries could also be sentenced to short terms of imprisonment in Rumeli Castle, halfway down the Bosporus. Nicole talks about working in the kitchen as punishment too. He describes it as spot bashing and calls it imprisonment in the kitchen. Of course, a punishment could not end without the soldier showing that he would be a good little Janissary in the future. After any punishment, the offender had to kiss the hand of his officer as a mark of his return to discipline. For me, this looks like an absolutely disgusting habit. It is a nasty psychological trick played on the subordinates who basically had to say thank you for receiving the punishment. But what about more serious offenses? For longer terms, the Janissaries were sent to the grim fortress at the bleak entry to the Black Sea, where cold winds blew while the sun shone on the sweet waters of Asia, opposite Romelia. And if this was not enough, the last very serious option was left. For a great crime, the Janissaries could be sentenced to death. If so, the man was first degraded and then expelled from the core before being strangled after dark. His corpse was flung into the sea. Such a sentence was carried out by one of the officers. Let's again listen to Goodwin. The cook was also responsible for discipline in the ranks and perhaps because he wielded the sharpest knives and was an experienced butcher, was the executioner. But he did not often kill or send culprits to prison or even put them in irons. The common punishment was to be made to act as cullion in the company kitchen. I think Goodwin mixes up some things at this point, since here he describes an execution as the work of a butcher, while before he talked about strangling. Nicole sheds more light on this. Discipline on the march was even stricter, with any damage to property being punished and compensation paid to victims. Desertions in time of war resulted in execution by strangling. The body was then placed in a weighted sack and dropped in a sea or a lake at night to avoid public shame. The procedure described by Goodwin seems to apply to deserters, while executions for other offenses could have involved some butchery. I have to add here that this quote lets me shake my head. First of all, the talks about punishment for damaging property sound so noble while we can be sure that there was a lot of order destruction. Second, it is funny how far the officials went to avoid any publicity when executing a deserter. Usually, you would expect them to make an example of it instead of hushing it up. It sounds like desertion was a problem more common than the sources try to make us believe. Poor Janissaries. A lot of rules and also a lot of most annoying punishments. We will soon hear what they got in return, but now we have to investigate another topic which is instrumental to keeping soldiers in line, religion. Oh yes, I said religion, and yes, I dare to touch this topic, where we will get to know the Dervish order of the Bektashis, which was integral to the Janissary's moral. The in Europe widely spread contemporary image of the fanatically fighting Janissaries resulted aside of the hard military training and their continuous deployments also from the creed, because of their mental connection to the dervish order of Bektashi. The stories of the connection between the Janissaries and the Haji Bektashi can be seen in the chronicles of Uruj, when Ali Pasha during the founding of the Yayas asked for a blessing for his new soldiers. Orhan Ghazi sent someone and obtained authority in Amasya from Haji Bektash of Khorasan and had a white cap brought. 
He first put it on himself and afterwards his dependent slaves put on the white cap. We can see here that according to the chronicles, the predecessors of the Janissaries got the distinctive white caps from Hachi Bektash. But is this really the case? Weinstein gives us the answer to this question. Obviously, for chronological reasons, the tradition of the creation of the Ochak by the Saint Hachi Bektashveli, founder of the Yorda, cannot be anything but a legitimizing legend. As a matter of fact, it is not even certain that the Bektashi impact molded the core from its very origin. But what was the incentive to muddle up the history of both the Janissaries and the Bektashi order? For the dervishes, the answer is clear. They gained access to one of the most respected institutions in the Ottoman Empire, and thereby a lot of influence. For the other side, Goodwin provides an answer by looking at the dervishes' early history. Moreover, these fierce frontiersmen protected and advanced the borderlands because there were brothers among them endowed with such religious fanatism that the daring made them invincible in battle. The Ottomans were later to harness this fervor and use it as a bridge over which the Janissaries could traverse the breach defenses of the foes. They were not a suicide brigade, however, since the enemies usually fled and the greatest honor was awarded to those who achieved the highest heap of infidel dead. I think it is understandable that a good portion of fanaticism is useful for soldiers with a considerable chance of death. Or at least it was useful for the Sultan. Moreover, the ascetic lifestyle demanded by the dervishes fitted very well to that of the Janissaries. Through its history, the Janissary Ochak was popular among the poorest members of society, perhaps because of its almost socialist attitudes which in turn resulted from the deep influence of the Bagdashi dervish sect. I will not discuss socialism here because in the end someone will show up and say it was not real socialism anyway. At this point it is enough to establish that in their ascetic lifestyle Bagdashis and Janissaries fitted together very well. But there was another point in the religious views of the Bagdashis, which made it very appealing to the Janissaries. To understand it, we must remember where the Janissaries came from and how they were recruited. Bekdashi doctrines contained aspects of ancient Turkish paganism, Buddhism, a strong element of Shia Islam and Christian influences. The latter included a trinity of God, the Prophet Muhammad and the Caliph Ali. The main difference between the Bekdashi and the Orthodox Sunni Muslims was a Bekdashi belief that in the final analysis all religions were valid. Some dervish preachers maintained that Christians and Jews were not really infidels, while a few even had Christian followers. Remember that most Janissaries were forcefully recruited at a young age and put into a strange environment. Nearly all of them were born Christians. The Bagdashi beliefs made it easier for them to accept the new social milieu since it was open to the boys' former religion and at least in some aspects even similar to Christianity. Therefore the Janissaries and the Bagdashi dervishes melted into one institution. The great master of the order even became the commander of the 99th order, and every other order had some dervishes too, just like in the West we have military chaplains today. The Janissaries even called themselves sons of Hachi Bagdash. Over time, myths developed connecting the early history of the Janissaries with the Bagdashi orders. Palma even calls those legends Bagdashi propaganda. An example is the story on the origin of the burg the Janissaries had. When Osman I was hard pressed, Haji Bagdash sent him miraculous reinforcements. These troops complained of being insufficiently or improperly clad for the duty, and thereupon Haji Bagdash cut pieces of felt from the hem of his robe and laid these on their heads. From all the legends, I like this one the best, because we learn from it that the early Janissaries cared about entering battle well dressed in fashionable felt. Jokes aside, the legend goes further and claims that the Yen part in Janissary comes from Chen, meaning sleeve. This gloss seems to record the transition to the form of the legend which appears in European writers from the 17th century onwards 
and according to which the Janissary's headdress originated through the sleeves of Haji Bekdash falling over the Janissary's head and down his back when Bekdash was giving him a blessing. This incident reaches a final form in which it is said to have occurred on the field of the First Kosovo, immediately after the killing of Murat I by wounded Serbian, an event foreseen and foretold by Haji Bekdash, who is thereupon also put to death for failing to prevent what he had foreseen. This connection became popular in Europe and provided the foundation for the legend that the Berg resembled the sleeves of Haji Bekdash falling over the Janissary's head. And this probably is a good place to take a look at what we learned today. In the Ottoman Empire, the Sultan was the center of everything. This created a lot of covetousness. Therefore, the Sultan saw the Janissaries as an asset to face internal enemies. But thereby, the Janissaries themselves became a danger. In order to keep control over them, Murat I established some rules. Of course, where rules are, there are punishments. For the Janissaries, this could mean working in the kitchen, getting beaten, imprisonment or even death. Aside from punishment, religion was a useful tool employed by the Sultan for keeping his soldiers in line. Soon the dervishes of the Bekdashi order merged with the core. Their theological view were very useful for the integration of the Janissaries since they were open to Christianity and even shared some similarities like the Trinity. I think a good way to end this episode is due Bekdashi jokes which made me chuckle when I found them on Wikipedia. A Bekdashi was praying in the mosque, while those around him were praying, My God, grant me faith, he muttered. My God, grant me plenty of wine. The Imam heard him and asked angrily why instead of asking for faith, like everyone else, he was asking God for something sinful. The Bekdashi replied, Well, everyone asks for what they don't have. Bekdashi was a passenger in a rowing boat traveling from Eminönü to Üsküda in Istanbul. When a storm blew up, the boatsman tried to reassure him by saying, Fear not, God is great! The Bekdashi replied, Yes, God is great, but the boat is small! And now it's your turn again. Do you think that it was a stupid idea of the Sultan to build up such a powerful core as the Janissaries? Do you think he will be able to control it? So long. We'll meet again in two weeks. Stay critical, stay curious, stay free.